Let me say good morning to you. Good morning and good morning again. It is about 927, so I came on a little bit later than I expected to with so many different things going on and having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but seems like I've got everything squared away. So we have a little bit of a shorter time to greet one another than we normally would, but hopefully everyone is prepared. I hope you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 20, and our lesson is entitled Thoughts on the Lord's Supper. Uh, we're going to be in our adult book. If you have the regular print adult book, we're going to be on page 74 and 75 is where the lesson begins. For those that do not know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. I pastor New Hebrew Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be for 14 years now. So hopefully everyone is prepared and ready. If you don't have a Sunday school book, you can still get your Bibles, as I said earlier, and we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 to, verses 20 to verse 34. Uh, good morning to everyone that's logging on to me. I see some of the faces and the names. Uh, hope everyone is doing well. I hope you have your coffee. I got my coffee. I got my water. Got all my stuff here uh, on the desk. Good to go. Got my Bible ready. There we go. Getting everything lined up as, at least as best as I can. Get my chair set up straight here. There we go. So good morning to you, Brother Tidwell, to my Aunt Rosetta, uh, Brother Brown. Looks like Brother Howell and some others. My cousin Joey and his wife. Hope you guys are doing fine. And when you get that water with you and you get that coffee at the perfect temperature, that's when you know you're in business right there. Uh, good morning to you, Sister Turner. Hope you're doing fine. Sister Waller as well. To John and Tanya. Good morning, everybody. To Sister Delisa Mitchell and Brother Jeffrey Mitchell. Good morning to you all. I pray everyone is doing fine. Uh, we have a good lesson this morning. The lesson is... It's got some very good elements on being selfish. You know, we shouldn't be selfish, being considerate, um, about learning some uh, spiritual uh, applications about the Lord's Supper and even practical applications about etiquette, things of this nature. So it's a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to be covering the communion verses, the verses that we normally would read on the first Sunday. Uh, Sister Bonita Lane Robinson, God bless you also. Uh, this is lesson number six, and it looks like the unit that we are in is entitled Instructions to a Troubled Church, and today the lesson is entitled Thoughts on the Lord's Supper. So go ahead and get yourselves ready, get your Bible, get your Sunday school book. It's 930, and we're going to begin with a word of prayer. And then we're going to dive into our lesson for this morning. So uh, for those that are able, we want to ask you um, to pause multitasking if you can, to sit up in your bed if you're in the bed, get your coffee, and let's have a word of prayer together. So let's pray. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for rest. Thank you for sleep. Thank you for protection while we were asleep. Thank you for waking us up this morning. And thank you for your word, Lord. Help us when we go through your word to go through it with a serious look, to go through it with the intent of learning and applying what we learn to how we live. And Father, we just pray for the grace when we make our mistakes and failures. And sometimes, Father, if we're just honest, there are things that we know we should do, but we still choose another route. Forgive us for that. We pray that everyone can be blessed by your word. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. So, we're going to go ahead and get started. Mm. That sun is reflecting. I, I hate to say this. The sun's reflecting off of me. It, it's, it gets brighter than it gets, it gets dim. So, in any case, we're going to go ahead and dive in. Now, today, I'm going to go ahead and read the verses. And I want you to follow along with me. It's a lengthy section, verses 20 to 34. So follow along with me as I read. I'm beginning in verse 20. 
when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone takes before other his own supper, supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, uh, that you came not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Paul says, I'll take care of the rest of it when I arrive to be with you. A lengthy passage, and with a passage so length, lengthy and so many themes and principles to discuss, I wanted to at least read it, and I want to encourage you to read it. It is difficult in the time we have to give an adequate amount of, of attention to every verse. So I'll do the best that I can uh, as I do kind of get started. Good morning to you, Brother Mance, like Brother Mance on here with us. Uh, good morning to you, Brother Mance. Uh, so our lesson is broken up into three sections. We've got the rebuke for selfishness, the second section, the body and the blood, the third section, self-examination. Now we'll start with verses 20. 21 and 22, and it's talking about rebuke for selfishness. Verses 20 and 21, and if you recall in verses 20, Paul said, when you come together, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Verse 21, uh, for what you're doing is everyone takes before other his own supper. One is hungry and another is drunken. Uh, our lesson kind of gives a good introduction, page 76 in the adult book, the second paragraph under Paul's contention. It says, another area of division came into observance on the Lord's Supper. Paul's been dealing with all their issues. Here's yet another issue concerning the Lord's Supper. Um, not surprisingly, economic status varied in the church as the gospel was preached to both the wealthy and the poor. Dividing lines were drawn between the rich and the poor at the Lord's Supper with the rich, gorging themselves while the poor was being shut out. Now, we, we, we can see when they would do the Lord's Supper, they would have kind of a potluck situation. They would have a feast. Uh, the Corinthians would even call it a love feast. And the people who were wealthy, who had high economic status, of course, they would bring more food and probably better food. The people who were poor, lesser economic status, well, they would bring what they had. But what began to happen is the people who brought a whole bunch of food ate a whole bunch of food. And they were kind of leaving the poor out. And that's why Paul says, when you come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It should be, but that's not what you're doing. 
And they would also have wine. They wouldn't have the juice that we have. They would have literal wine. Now, their wine in the New Testament times, much of it was a drinking substitute to water. They didn't have clean, pure, purified, filtered water. Now, the wine that they would have would be diluted so much, it would take a lot of it to cause you to have a change of mind, but that just shows you how much they were drinking. So that's why he says in verse 21, uh, in eating, everyone is taking before other his own supper, meaning you're eating what you brought, you're doing it in front of the poor, and you got some people going home hungry, the poor, and the rich people, they were eating and drinking, and they were going home drunk. And this is uh, an area of contention that Paul is trying to address. He's showing, let me state what you're doing. You're doing, you're uh, observing the Lord's Supper improperly. Under Paul's contention, one, two, the third paragraph in our Sunday school book. What the church, uh, when the church would gather, there would typically be a common meal served for everyone to enjoy and participate in. The meal that was served was called the Lord's Supper, as the bread and the cup were featured in it. And that's what we just explained, what I just explained to you. Jump to the very next paragraph. Look at what it says. The problem with the way the Corinthians were observing the meal was that every person was out for himself. So we got selfishness. Here we go. Each person treated the meal as though it was his or her own instead of a communal meal that it was intended to be. Those who had plenty to bring had plenty to eat, but those who had little or nothing to bring were left out and went hungry. Others were using this time as an opportunity to get drunk. So you had people who were... Uh, uh, they were selfish. You got selfishness. You've got drunkenness. And all mixed up, they're trying to look back at the price Jesus paid for their salvation. And this became a stain. Now, let's talk about that as we set the context. Paul, in the, the major specific theme, Paul is saying to people, when you come to this love feast, when you should be showing love uh, and equally distributing the food, whether you are wealthy or whether you are poor, Paul said you're not doing that. And what? And in your selfishness, in your gain uh, or, or your greed to gain only for yourself, it is a contradiction to be selfish and drunk to be drunkenness, and then saying, "Oh, thank you, Jesus, for how good you're being for shedding your blood." Paul said these things contradict each other. But there's also something very, very practical at play. Plain old etiquette. My people from the South, my, everybody in Pine Bluff, everybody in Little Rock, we would say it this way. Some people don't have home training. Like, it, let, let's just bring this to a modern sensibility. When you have a potluck, a feast, a fellowship, it is not proper etiquette. If you bring a bag of ice, but you leave with seven take-home plates, well, of course, some people have more need than other needs. Some people have a difficult financial situation as opposed to other people's financial situation. But if you bring the least and take home the most, that's just not proper etiquette. That's just not practical. It's to the point to where, and we'll just keep it kind of, in a very modern way to look at this, to put us in the mindset of what Paul is addressing that the Corinthians were doing. It's as if you have the fellowship upstairs at New Hebron in the fellowship hall, and before a person sits down to eat, they made three to-go plates and took them to their car and then came back up there, and then they sat down and ate, and then when it was over food that was left over, then they were saying, give me that, give me that, give me that, give me that. You're like, man, you, you left with two-thirds of the food. There may have been people, and, and we're just using the analogy that uh, from us and applying it to the text to make it understand, you never know. There could have been people who were really, 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 really hungry. 
And maybe you couldn't tell by the car they drove or the clothes they wore, but they really were having a rough go at it. And this meal would have been one less meal they would have had to add to their budget. But they only got a little piece of scraps of fruit and a piece of bread because somebody was selfish and they took home more than they brought or they were only thinking about themselves. And that's what Paul is addressing. The Corinthians, while trying to observe the Lord's communion, while trying to say, thank you, Lord, for the price you paid for our salvation, commemorating the death of Christ, something so significant. On the other side of that, they were being selfish and you had drunkenness. And so Paul is saying, y'all, we got to stop this. Be fair, be equitable. On a very practical sense, show some etiquette, show good home training. What do we tell our kids? Stop begging. How many times have you been with your kids? And kids are kids, so you have to train them. We all have been there. And they'll be at somebody's house. And if you're like me, you give them a speech before you go in. Now you already ate. So don't go in here begging for food. Just because you see a piece of this or a piece of that, you've eaten, you're full. Hey, act like you've got some food. Now don't do that. And what's your kid do? Can I have some? Can I have some? Can I? You better stop begging. You're training them. You're teaching them. Proper etiquette. They didn't, not, not only did the Corinthians not have proper etiquette, they were also causing a stain on this feast, which was to commemorate Christ. So Paul is writing to kind of address these issues. And then Paul rebukes them in verse number 22. Paul says in verse 22, if you just want to eat, don't you have a house you can eat at? Like, have you not houses to eat and drink? He says, and he's asking these rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question is a question where the answer is obvious. Don't you have a house to eat and drink in? Yes. Do you despise the church of God? Well, of course not. Do you just try to, are you just trying to shame the people who are poor or, or who don't have? You shouldn't be. Paul said, if you think I'm going to praise you for what you're doing, I'm not. It is not praiseworthy. It is not thankworthy when what you are doing is causing a stain on this spiritual event. And even in a practical way, I'm going to use a modern example to bring this out. In a practical way, it is not praiseworthy. It is not stainworthy or, or, or thankworthy when you show up to the barbecue at your whomever house and you're like, well, let me go and make a plate for my girlfriend. Let me go and make a plate for my boyfriend. Let me go and make a plate for the people at work. Let, eat the food first. Let, let us who are here, who participated, let us enjoy the meal and we can worry about divvying up the food if we have something left over. Stop being so selfish to where you're stacking 18 plates in your car and you haven't even eaten yet. Tell your girlfriend she should have came. Tell your boyfriend he could have came. Tell whomever at work, they, they were invited too. So it's, it's kind of etiquette and it's spirituality. And Paul is saying to him, listen, if all you wanted to do was eat and drink, you could have stayed at home. Well, why? He's very practical here. God is very practical. Why would you get food, bring food, prepare food, and then eat the food you prepared? You could have just did that at home. If you're not going to share, then why did you bring it? That's kind of what he's alluding to in verse 22. I'm going to read uh, Paul's rebuke, the very first paragraph. Paul was alarmed at what he had uh, at what he had heard concerning the observance of the Lord's Supper. He asked the church while they were using a community meal as an opportunity to eat like they would at home. He points out that when they gathered together. It was supposed to be for the greater, for a greater purpose more than a regular meal. They were to share so that everyone could partake equally. And that was Paul's goal. Paul is saying, you're trying to show unity in Christ, oneness with Christ, but you don't recognize not only are you shaming the poor, because you brought more, they didn't have more, you're eating more, you're showing your selfishness as well. And so Paul rebukes them. Paul is saying, if you think I'm going to praise you and pat you on the back for this, 
not going to happen. And the reason I won't pat you on, to back, on the back for this or praise you for this or commend you for this is because it is not a good action at all. And then Paul, Paul does something that is instructive to every good teacher and certainly instructive to every Bible teacher. You see, more than just point out the wrong, Paul then launches into pointing out how they can correct the wrong, how they should be. Because it is easy to sit on the sideline and point out everything that should be done wrong. It takes it to an entirely different level when now the opportunity is presented for you. Well, since you say this is bad, give me a better way. You see, anyone can be a fault finder. And what Paul is about to show, beginning in verse 23, he's not a fault finder. He sees their wrong. Well, then Paul says, let me show you how it should be. And Paul begins in verse 23 to give them instructions on the proper way to observe the Lord's Supper and Communion. Paul says in verse 23, I received of the Lord, meaning his instructions were given to him directly from Christ himself. That which I delivered unto you, meaning I've already told you, I'll tell you again. These things I'm about to tell you, they took place at a certain date on God's calendar. The same night in which the Lord uh, was betrayed, that's when he took the bread. Now, what Paul does is, the, the lesson is entitled this section, verse 23, uh, the revelation entrusted to Paul. I'm going to read the first sentence in verse 23 um, under that section in our Sunday school book. Once again, page 77 in the adult book, regular print, the revelation entrusted to Paul based on verse 23. It says, as upset as Paul may have been with the Corinthian behavior, he was not content with just shaming them with his rebuke and leaving them to their sin. They needed to be instructed on how to conduct themselves at the Lord's table. And that's what Paul goes on to do. Now, jump down to verse 24. Jesus took bread, verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this. This do in remembrance of me. Now, when it talks about the bread that represents his body, it was kind of a wafer-like, round-like, saucer-like piece of bread, and they would break it. And he said, the same way I'm breaking this bread and giving it to you, the disciples in the upper room. It's the same way my body, Sister Joanne Suggs, the same way my body, Sister Sheila Spearman, Jesus is saying that's the same way my body is going to be broken for you. Listen, when it says broken, the Old Testament does testify that they did not break any bones of Jesus. They did not. Oftentimes when the uh, uh, people being crucified were hanging on the cross, they would put a stump under their feet. And as they would droop down, they would begin to suffocate. And to alleviate the suffocation, they would push up on the nails or the stump under their feet with the nails also, and it would relieve them from suffocating. But when, but when they pushed up with their feet, they're putting pressure on the spike that's going through their feet. So it was a win-win horrible way. It was a no-win situation. So what they would do is they would break the legs of the people being crucified. And they would droop down, unable to push up with their legs because their bones were broken and they would expedite the suffering and the death. When it came to Jesus and they were going to break his legs, he had already died. There were no bones broken in his body as the Old Testament prophesied. So when it says his body is broken, it means bruised. It means beaten. It refers to the manner in which they tortured our Savior. And so he said, when he had given thanks, he took the bread, he broke it and said, this bread, this is my body. And this body is broken for you. 
And he said, as you commune, as you have the Lord's Supper, think about that. Do this in remembrance of me. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14. Isaiah 52 and verse 14. You can write the verse down, or if you're quick, you can turn to it. Isaiah speaks about how his visage, the way he looked, the way he appeared, his visage was marred unlike any man. I'm going to pull that verse. I want to read that entire verse. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14. And you may hear me quote this. As many were astonished or astonished at you. If you were to see Jesus, you would cover your mouth. It was gruesome. His visage, the way he looked, he appeared, was marred more than any other man. And his form more than the sons of man. That is an Old Testament prophetic way that Isaiah speaks of. Isaiah is hundreds of years before the birth of Christ prophesying about the death of Christ. And he said, when Christ is hanging on the cross, it will not be a pretty picture. This is not the type of picture that you would want hanging in a church. This is not the type of picture that you would want hanging in your home. This was brutal. This was gruesome. This was disturbing. It would be akin to seeing the actual photos from a murder. It would be akin to seeing the actual photos of a burn victim or a shot victim. They blur things out on television. And I think in our culture, we've kind of blurred things out. We've got this cultural picture of this individual hanging on the cross who looks like a shampoo model who has blue eyes and rosy cheeks and he almost looks comfortable up there with a couple of trickles of blood coming from his side. That is not what Jesus looked like. So when Jesus said, my body will be broken for you, he's actually saying, I'm going to go through a lot. Listen, this will not be a pretty scene. This is not something that you will be able to look at and then have a meal. You're going to take a minute to have to conduct yourself. So don't just roll over the words of verse 24. He said, take, eat this bread. It represents my body, which was broken for you. He said, remember that as you're going through communion. And if your mind is on that, if your mind is on the price that Christ paid, to purchase our salvation, to atone for our sins with his blood. If that's the thought process of your mind, if that's what makes your heart beat, it's kind of hard to be that way and then to defraud your neighbor because they're less than you economically. It's kind of hard to be selfish and greedy and, and, and to, 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 to only think about me, myself, and I, to gorge on food and alcohol. But yet, I'm so grateful for what Christ has done for me. That's what Paul is trying to reconcile. Paul is saying these two things do not line up. This is oil and this is water. And then he goes further. After the same manner, he took the cup. When he's cup, when he had sup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood meaning the blood that he shed on Calvary, instituted a new testament, and it was ratified by the death of our Savior. The new testament in my blood, do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, as often as you have the Lord's Supper, as often as you commune with me, you do show or symbolize the Lord's death until he come. Now I want you to look at something. It kind the verses so far have given us some clues to the thought process, the view of how we should observe the Lord's communion. In verse 25, he says, "Do these things." Well, I'm a, I'm gonna wait to verse 25, 26, and 27. When he says, "Do this in." I think it is in remembrance of me, verse 25. That's the first time we look at that. Now, look at verse 27. There we go. 25 says something here to us. 26 says something here to us. And also 28. 
says something here to us about the views we should have. Verse 28, but let a man, man or woman, boy or girl, human, person, examine himself, not your neighbor, not your family, but yourself. And so as you examine himself, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, now, now look at that. I want to look at these three phrases. I got a bit ahead of myself a second ago. He says, he said, he said in verse 25, the last phrase, he said, as you drink this, you do it in remembrance of me. In verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do it, you do show the Lord's death till he come. In verse 28, you need to examine yourself. And, and, and here's what I mean. There's a threefold look that should be a good template to help govern and guide our heart and mind as we observe the Lord's communion and the Lord's Supper. You are to do it in remembrance of him. Remember the pain and the shame. Remember what he did to purchase your sin. Remember how they beat him unmercifully. And you remember what he went through for you. So it's a look back. And he said, you do, do, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, friends, that's a look ahead. That means as you commune and have the Lord's Supper, you do it in the mindset of knowing he's coming back again. I get it. People say, oh, they've been talking about Jesus come back for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Just because it doesn't happen or hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't happen. He's coming back again. He said, you do this till he come, come again. And then, so we have a look back in remembrance of him. We have a look ahead. We do it until he come. And in verse 28, we have a look inside. Let a man examine himself. What am I actively involved in? How am I spiritually? What is my level of devotion to God? How devoted to him am I? How much do I serve? How often am I trying to get better? We are to examine ourselves, not anyone else, but examine ourselves. We're to look back in remembrance of him. We're to look ahead till he come. And we're to look inwardly and examine ourselves. Your mind should be on these facets, not defrauding your brother. Not how many roles can I get at the end of the fellowship? Not can I get the rest of that? Not can I take this home? Not can I get it to go plate? Uh, I brought a whole bunch of food because I'm wealthy at this potluck, at this fellowship. But I'm not going to share it with the poor because those who have less and those who have nothing, well, that's too bad. So mm -mm, it, it's, it's these two thought processes are wrong. And Paul, it, or they're contradictory. And Paul is setting them right Paul is calibrating the way that they should observe the Lord's communion. And as it relates to verse 28, let a man examine himself and then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Examine yourself and then partake of the Lord's communion. For, verse 29, he that eats and drinks unworthily, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. It has nothing to do with the Lord's body, meaning just because you observe it improperly doesn't mean what Jesus did is some kind of way tainted because you've observed it, observed it un, uh, un, improperly, excuse me. And so what does he mean, he that eats and drinks unworthily? Well, look at the last two letters in the word unworthily, L-Y. Unworthily, this word is an adverb not an adjective. It doesn't describe the person who drinks it. It describes the manner that a person is drinking it. Here's the dis distinction. It doesn't describe us because we are unworthy. If they weren't defrauding their brother, 
if they were sharing with their neighbors, the poor and those who don't have, if they weren't drinking in excess and you got selfishness and drunken, if none of these things were taking place, if they were at church every Sunday, if they were at Bible study every Wednesday, if they read their Bible in the morning, at noon, at night, if they prayed and fasted, if they loved and cared and showed, if they did all these wonderful things, Isaiah says it this way, your best is as a filthy rag before the Lord. There is nothing that we can do in a very literal sense. We are not good enough. The works that we do, the way that we live can never rise to a point to where we can say, Lord, look at how good I live for them five minutes. Friends, you cannot take your best five minutes of living and think that's going to warrant you entrance into heaven. Good is not good enough. God's standard of righteousness, none of us are able to obtain it. No, that's why Paul says in Romans chapter three, there is none righteous, no, not one. Don't fool yourself. Don't think because you go to church and someone else doesn't go to church, you don't get drunk, somebody always gets drunk. You don't use marijuana, somebody over there doing it. You don't steal from the office, they're taking papal, Paper, pens, pre- oh, they robbing off. You don't cheat on your taxes, someone else. I'm better than them. Listen, there are some things you are more obedient than them in. Yes, that is, of course, but none of us meet God's standard. So this word is not an adjective. None of us are worthy of what God does for us. But it's an adverb. It describes the way a person is drinking it. When you know you are actively intentionally, volitionally, willfully diving headlong into sin. You're backpedaling. You're backstroking in the waters and seas of sin. You don't care. You know it ain't right. You promote what's wrong. He said, he said, this might not be a time for you because what you're doing is you're eating and drinking judgment to yourself. It doesn't affect God, but it's to your detriment not to his. You see, it's one thing, and we'll use the analogy of driving your car. It's one thing to be on the freeway, and you know how you're just keeping up with traffic, the speed limit on the freeway is 65 or 70, everybody's going 80 or 85, and you're not paying attention. You're like, well, I know I'm going faster than I should be, and the police officer just picks you out. I don't care if it was 15 more people, you get your ticket. You're like, oh, Mama, I, I wasn't trying to do that. that. That's one thing. It's another thing to no matter where you are, the street, the freeway, a parking lot, a school zone in front of the church, you just drive fast. You don't care what the speed limit is. You don't care about stop signs, about red lights, about yellow lights. You don't care about yield signs. You don't care when the bus stops and the stop sign comes out. You don't care. Listen, you're going to break the laws of driving no matter what. That's different than the person who gets caught speeding every now and then. The person who just volitionally, willfully, intentionally going against what they know is right and then going to say, going to take the Lord's Supper. He said, nah, you better examine yourself. Are you putting up at least a fight against sin? Is there any remorse against sin? Is there anything in you that said, Lord, this is not the life for me. I want to change. Is there any spark of repentance? Any spark of remorse? Or are you doing what Paul says, uh, Peter, excuse me, people that glory in their shame? See, these are two different things. He said, listen, if you're glorying in your shame, he said, listen, let me tell you something. He said, you're drinking and eating unworthily. You know what you're involved in. None of us can flip a switch and sin just stops. Some things, maybe, but from experience and from what we see in the Bible, it takes a while for that train of sin to come to a complete stop. It takes trial and error. It takes test and retest. You're trying to clean up your speech. Yes, believe it or not, there are people who struggle with talking without using profanity. They're trying to clean their speech up. They're trying not to say these words. They're trying not to express themselves in a rude and crude manner. And it takes time. 
It takes practice. It takes, oh, Lord, there, I got cut off in traffic, Father. I'm sorry. That's just one area of your life. So we're not, God is not expecting us to show up to church with our nice outfits on and everybody sitting out there is just perfect. No, 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 no. Of course not. That's why he gives us repentance. <laughs> That's why we have prayer. That's why we steadily, over time, increase in our maturity. It takes time. This is a process. It's not instantaneous. So, of course, everybody is struggling with something. But is there an area of your heart to where you close the door and you put the off-limits sign up to God? To where you say, Lord, I shouldn't be doing that, but I don't want help on that right now. He's saying if that becomes a pattern of your life to where you know you are aware and then you don't even care, he said you're eating and drinking unworthily. In that manner, the Corinthians, you knew what you were doing was wrong. You've been doing this for who knows how long. You've been shunning the poor. You've been making them feel ashamed because they're less than. You've been bringing a whole bunch of food and eating a whole bunch of food right in their faces. And those who have little or nothing go home with little or nothing. It's not an equal dis uh, dispersed meal between the haves and the have-nots. Paul is saying, now y'all know better than this. So you better examine yourself. And then he gives the, the warning for this cause. What cause? Eating and drinking unworthily. Eating and drinking the Lord's Supper, observing it. And there's an area in your life or pockets in your life to where you say, God, that's off limits to you. I do not want your help. I know it's wrong. I don't care it's wrong. I'm going to keep doing it. He said, for this cause, many are weak and sickly. And it, the last thing, and many sleep. Physical sickness. And when he says sleep, he don't mean take a nap. He means physical death. Because you constantly Fly your fist in the face of heaven because you constantly rebel against me and you know what you're doing is not right and I'm trying to help you with it and you reject and reject and reject and reject and reject. That's one thing, but in that rejection and promotion of what is right, you still try to act and perpetrate as if me and you are unified and on one accord and you can't even treat your brother right. You're eating and drinking and... You're eating food that should be dispersed to the poor, and all of you have it, but it's just a who's who club. The rich folk over here, the poor folk over there. Paul says there does come a time to where God will and oftentimes can show you he's really in charge. That you can bring upon yourself physical ailments. You can, God can actively cause it, or passively allow it. God can do that. And what this shows us is not that God is mean and crude and callous. Some of you are weak and sickly, sickly and some of you sleep. Mm -mm. This shows us just how serious God took the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. It's nothing to be played with. It's nothing to be toyed with. It's nothing to go into haphazardly. No, 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 no. When you, if we, I'll say it this way, could have seen the physical beating that Jesus took, if we could have seen his broken body and that shed blood and nails piercing the flesh, a nail piercing the feet into wood, a sign over his head, his body being scourged with the cat of nine tails, skin and muscles exposed, whips, and he's going up and down on a cross and the open pain of the open wounds causing pain as he stands and rises and falls. And you're going to make a mockery of that? By coming to church like, oh, this ain't about nothing, man. I'm, hurry up. Let's, we're trying to get to the game. You, you, the Corinthians, you're going to make a mockery of that? 
by shunning the poor, by having the, the, the who's who cool club of rich people and doing it in front of poor people and showing that you're out of fellowship with each other, but communing in a ceremony to act as if you are in fellowship with God, God takes that seriously. That just shows you how serious it is. And because God takes it seriously, let's make some practical application. We should take it seriously. Stop your kids from walking when we're having communion. Make them sit down. Stop getting up and all of a sudden you didn't hell going to the bathroom the whole service. Now you can't sit here for 10 more minutes. Stop your cell phone. Stop texting. Stop tweeting. Get off social media. That should be a serious time. All of it should be. But certainly at this point, when we're looking back in remembrance of me, what Jesus did for us, when we're looking ahead till he's come, till he come again, he's coming back again. When we're looking inside, let a man examine himself. Lord, am I showing a fight against sin? Am I remorseful at things in my life that are out of place? And in that process or that time, you just let your kid go from one side to the other side. Oh, go on up there, baby. Go, go up there and get your game. But sit that boy, that girl down. Adults, sit down. Be respectful. Of, don't do anything to stain this moment. People cut their cell phones off at a graduation most time so, that, so they don't interfere with the speaker. So certainly we want to observe it because it is a serious time, a time where Christ has paid for our sins. And then he says, verse 31, guess what? If we were to examine or judge ourselves, then we wouldn't be judged. He goes further. But when we are judged, when God judges us, we are chastened of the Lord. God punishes us. And he does it so that we would not be condemned with the world. This is punishment. For the people, and, and, and I know I won't have time to adequately elaborate on verses 33 and 34, but let me dispel a false narrative about God. God does judge people. God does punish people. Oh, I get it. Nobody wants to hear that message. They want to hear the pie in the sky, the loving and forgiving God, and he is those things. But he's also a God that punishes. And God is saying, listen, if you judge yourself, if you examine yourself, you can preemptively correct behavior before I correct it. But if you don't, God is saying, listen, I'll help you. I'll examine you. I'll judge you. And guess what I'll do? I can take you out to my spiritual woodshed and dust off the dust on the back of your jeans. I can give you a little whooping there, a little spanking. And God says, Paul is saying that God does that so that we are not condemned with the world. Because if you act like the world, if you talk like the world, if you live like the world, if you walk like the world, you will be condemned like the world. Yes, you will. And God is saying, I don't want that. So let me give you a lesser pain now to prevent the greater tragedy later. Isn't that what we do to our kids? Yes, the Bible does say that if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. It does say in Proverbs that if you withhold corporal punishment, you don't even love your child. He said that can save your child's soul from hell. Not that that's the only tool that you use. Of course not. But the principle behind what we do is we want to give them the lesser pain now to prevent the greater pain later. And let's just talk about that. If you let your child disrespect you in the second grade, if you let your child disrespect you in the first grade, if you allow your child to be rebellious and disrespect you in the fourth grade, you don't have a hope when they're 20 years old. You don't have no, This is as easy as it's going to get. If they can get away with it at seven, you can't do nothing with them at 21 years old. And that's... That, that's why we've heard the expression, curve the tree when it's still green. So yes, we know that principle 
of the lesser pain to help prevent the greater pain. So the lesser pain is maybe a spanking. The lesser pain is extra chores. The lesser pain is go to bed early. The lesser pain is add fill in the blank. Because if that rebellion remains, it will not stay dormant. It's going to spread. And they won't listen to you. And they're not used to listening to authority. And then they don't listen to teachers. They don't listen to uh, principal. They don't listen to coaches. They don't listen to counselor. And guess what? They don't listen to cops. And when you don't listen to a cop, there can be an awkward ending to that situation. So you want to prevent some of the potential stuff down the road. And that's all God is saying. He's saying, but when we are judged, God judges us. He chastens us. He does it out of love. And he does it out of love that we would not be condemned with the world. So I'll just read the last two verses and we'll come to a close. He said, when you come together, tarry for one another. Wait for one another. Wait. But take time. Don't, don't just hog up all the food. C come on, y'all. He here's the solution. Since y'all been bringing all this food, rich people, and you've been taking the food home and you haven't been sharing, he said, listen, when you bring this food, share. Wait on one another. Disperse it. Don't have a me, myself, and I mindset. He said, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order. Paul says, I'll take care of the rest when I get there. So we can see from this, this is God's instruction on communion on the Lord's Supper. There's a ton more that we could dive into. I, I don't think... Uh, the amount of time that we have now is sufficient for it. But I do believe we have enough to where we can see God's viewpoint on this. So let me say to you that I, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Uh, we appreciate those that have shared and sacrificed to, and I know for some, maybe you work a late shift and you get off at 3, 4, 5 in the morning and it's hard to be up this morning to be with us. God, of course, knows and appreciates every sacrifice that has been made for him. Don't forget, Lord willing, next Sunday, it's Easter Sunday, we're going to have the Easter egg hunt at the church for the kids, so we certainly want them to be there. We want all of the parents and grandparents and family to be there. Let's go to this Resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday, and let's get our heart and mind prepared to thank the God that was crucified, but yet he rose for our sins. So God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. Uh, I want to thank you in advance. Don't neglect to honor God in your giving. Uh, many of you are familiar with the ways that you can give to be uh, of financial support to this ministry. So please, you can go to our church website, newhebronlr.org, uh, and you can find all of that. That's for the membership. Anything for any visitors, guests, and friends is all optional, whatever you feel, or if you do feel, we would appreciate it. But for those that are members, let's make sure that we show our love at home for the God that blessed us so much. So we'll be back in about 20 minutes, and we'll begin with our morning worship. We're going to begin with our sermon series entitled, The Need to Grow. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. So I hope to see you back then. Tell somebody else to join you. God bless you, and I pray God keeps you safe until we meet again.